Hello everyone, I suppose anyone who hasn't seen me around before, I'm Connor and I'm the auditor of TPSA and this evening I'm happy to have Professor Sinead Ryan here who's the Chair of the Theoretical High Energy Physics and also Head of the School of Maths here in Trinity and this evening she'll be talking us through the standard model of particle physics and what may or may not be possible to answer in the future. So first of all, congratulations on your new student association. So it's great to see you guys getting organised and, uh, and having talks and, and really, you know, um, identifying as theoretical physicists. So I can only approve. Um, okay. So as Connor said, I, I'm going to try to give you a flavour of what's happening in in particle physics. So this is a vast subject. Obviously, there's a lot going on. There are many different aspects of this uh, field, experimental and theoretical. I talk probably mostly about theoretical particle physics, but of course experimental things will come into it as well. And uh, I'll try to give you a sense of what's possible, um, what we know currently and what it's built on, and where the big questions are and where some of the answers might lie as well. Um, okay, so let's see first of all if this works. Um, okay, so um, I'll come back in a couple of slides to the title itself and in particular to this idea of knowns and unknowns, but from, for the moment, let's just think about what we want to be able to do. So a guiding principle, if you like, for uh, theoretical particle physics is to try to understand uh, nature, the structure and the nature of matter in terms of the most fun fundamental objects that you, can, um, that you can think about. And so if you peer inside an atom and some of the length scales are given here, which is already uh, obviously uh, quite a small object. If you look deep inside the atom, of course, you discover a nucleus. And then again, when you look inside the nucleus, you discover that that itself has some structure. Inside the, the nucleus, we have protons and neutrons. And inside those objects, there's even more structure. And so that brings us to the fundamental objects that we know of today at the moment, with very strong experimental evidence that these are fundamental objects. So these are quarks. And you can see the sorts of length scales that we're talking about here. So this is 10 to the minus 16 centimeters, roughly speaking. So these are really subatomic, but really at a, at a very, very tiny scale. The electron, which, as you know, of course, is orbiting the nucleus, is itself a fundamental particle as well. So that's one of the, the suite of particles that we have. And what we'd like to know is, how does this, uh, how do these fundamental objects really interact uh, to give us what we see around us today. So that's a, a fundamental sort of guiding principle that we have in, in particle physics. And now we come to all of these knowns and unknowns. So I'll give you the etymology if you don't already know it for what we have uh, here. So there are known knowns, um, there are known unknowns, and we have unknown unknowns. So this picture gets shown a lot, of course, in, in these sorts of talks, but it's very useful to reflect for a minute on what it is we're really talking about when I talk about particle physics. So what we know uh, and have very strong evidence for, for are the visible matter. So when you look around you, when you look out in the night sky, when you see the stars and, and planets, that all counts as the visible matter in the universe. And this makes up roughly speaking about 4.65% of what we believe is the sort of total energy and matter content in the universe. And the rest is divided between dark matter and dark energy. Now dark matter I will say a little bit about later, so that really is something that we actually might be able to say something about. Um, and this comes from a starting point which is what we can see around us what we can actually operate with. Don't forget, if you're an experimental particle physicist, you can only really operate with things you can see and handle and manipulate. So you have to understand how to use the visible matter that you have at your disposal to find and identify the, let's say, invisible or dark matter. So I'll say a little bit about that. Um, but there is, a, there is hope, if you like, that um, we will understand more about dark matter in the near future. And there's very strong evidence for why there should be dark matter content <coughs> excuse me, in the universe. And again, I'll say a little bit about that. I have at least one plot that says something about that. And then the rest, which is this enormous 70% or so, 
of um, the energy and matter in the universe is this so-called dark energy, and we really have absolutely no idea. <clears throat> from a theoretical perspective, also from, obviously from an experimental perspective, we really don't know how to explain that. So this is the energy that really was sort of blasted out into the universe in the very early stages, so immediately after the Big Bang. And that energy which drove inflation in the early universe is, remains somewhat mysterious for us. So that's the sort of general picture. It's a little bit humbling, right, that we sit in this 4.6% piece of the, the pie, and that's what we know. And so all of the work that we do and all of the theories that we have are really trying to understand that tiny piece of the, the whole picture. Um, but you can learn a lot if you do a good job in that tiny piece. And so that's another aspect of the work that particle physicists do, is to use what you know as a test bed for new ideas, as a sandbox, if you like, to try to understand physics beyond that little sliver, um, and build out from it to understand a little bit more about the universe. OK, so this brings me to my classification theorem. So we are in a math department, so I have at least one theorem. So this isn't obviously a real theorem. <clears throat> so um, this tells you where the, the known knowns and the known unknowns and all of these things came from. So you're all way too young to remember Donald Rumsfeld. Um, but he was the Secretary of Defense under the Bush administration um, just after, probably at 9-11 and uh, certainly afterwards for the um, Iraq invasion. So Rumsfeld said uh, at some point in the security briefing, as we know, there are no knowns. These are the things that we know we know. <coughs> so I'm taking what he has said and I'm going to try to uh, use it to understand particle physics. So the known knowns are really the building blocks of visible matter, forces that govern their interactions, and that's essentially the 4.6%, if you like, of the pie that we saw a while ago. He went on to say that there are known unknowns. So these are the things that we know that we don't know. Okay, so what might that be? Well, that's the nature of dark matter. So what is this dark matter? We know it's out there, we know it should be there, but we don't really understand it in any meaningful way. Um, there are also, I would argue, known unknowns, even within the 4.6% of visible matter. So for example, we'll come on to this, the theory of how quarks and gluons interact uh, under the strong nuclear force is really not fully understood yet. So that is something we know that we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns, and these are the things that we don't know we don't know. Um, he went on to say, of course, these are the most challenging and difficult and also dangerous and worrying, uh, but that was in the context of um, WMD, Weapons of Mass Destruction, so perhaps not quite as um, difficult or as dangerous in particle physics, but we might certainly imagine that there could be new unexpected physics or there might be nothing, and that's also uh, slightly disturbing. If we uh, and, and you'll see later in the talk, um, motivate searches for new physics based on looking out beyond the 5% of the universe that we understand and find nothing, then that's also uh, a result, but it's uh, something that we would have to try to explain and understand. So here he is, that's Donald Rumsfeld. He said this on February the 12th, uh, 2002. The bits in green are him, the bits in pink for me. Um, okay. So, this is where we are essentially in particle physics. So we, as I said already, we want to understand how particles interact at a fundamental level. So we know that there are four uh, fundamental forces, so I'm sure you all know this as well, um, but what's useful to think about is the relative strength of these and the range of their interactions. And they're really very different, op really very different forces and the way in which they interact is, is very different. So from gravity, which of course, acts between massive objects, um, but at very, very long, large distances. It's quite a weak force. All the way through the weak force, so-called, the weak force got its name because it was weak in comparison to the strong force, so it governs particle decay. And electromagnetism, you all know and love, hopefully. Um, so this is how charged particles interact, electrically charged particles interact with each other. Uh, this 
course is mediated or carried by a photon, which carries um, the quanta or, or the force between these charged particles. Think about this as uh, how electrons interact by moving photons around the place. And of course, this is a long distance uh, force as well. And then finally, we come to the strong force, which is responsible for binding uh, quarks together. Um, so it acts at the level of the quarks and gluons. It has a force carrying particle called a gluon, but it's extremely strong. So we have this picture of interactions and forces. And a natural question from a theory perspective is whether there is a, sort of a, an umbrella theory that allows you to describe all of these forces, their interactions in terms of the fundamental particles that you see listed here uh, in some coherent way. <clears throat> so as always, XKCD has a cartoon to fit the moment. And so uh, here is their take on the four fundamental forces. Of course, gravity is an inverse square law, electromagnetism similarly, and then it all sorts of tails away as you try to explain what the strong nuclear force is and the weak force as well. Okay, so it's the same question. Is there a theory in which all of this fits together? And you can see, even from this cartoon, that they behave in quite different ways. Okay, so the answer is sort of yes, but mostly no. So the standard model is a unified picture of three out of the four <coughs> fundamental forces. So the name is terrible, for a start the standard model, it doesn't really give you any information. It hides a lot of the power and a lot of the theoretical effort that has gone into developing this model over uh, <clears throat> a very long period of time, from the early days of electromagnetic theory all the way through the uh, 1900s as we understood more about radioactivity and how particles decay. Um, up until the strong nuclear force when we understood a little bit about the more fundamental uh, operations, let's say, inside a proton. So this um, picture here tells you what the important um, ingredients are in the standard model. So it is the amalgamation of these particles that you saw uh, on the previous page, which carry the force. So gluons for the strong force, uh, photon for the electromagnetism, and the so-called W and Z bosons for the weak force. So there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot under the hood here that I'm not going to go into too much detail about, but just to keep in mind that we have the bosons, the gauge bosons, which mediate the interactions, and they then mediate interactions between the matter fermions, these quarks and leptons. And here on the quark side, we have six quarks, and we have the leptons, which are, again, familiar things like the electron, but also less familiar things like neutrinos. But they all fit into this category. And then the standard model, to be complete, needed one last piece, which was um, the Higgs boson, which explains how the fundamental particles that you see uh, here, so in particular the, the quarks, for example, how they get a mass under the theoretical structures that we have. So that at least one Higgs boson was required to explain and to have this picture pulled together. And as you know, we found the Atlas and CMS experiments um, at CERN found a Higgs boson not so long ago. But overall, this model has been, and it's not really a model, it's a theory, has been uh, an extraordinary success. So most people uh, refer to it as an embarrassing success. And that's because you, you, you know that it's not quite complete. Right? And I'll show you explicitly in, in a couple of slides why. But having said that, every experimental measurement that's been made to date is accommodated within this standard model. So there is no signal yet, no strong signal, let's say, yet that we have measured anything that violates this picture. And yet we somehow feel that it's not quite correct because it's, for a start, three out of four of the forces are accommodated in this picture. But nevertheless, it's a very beautiful interplay of theory and experiment 
So in the early days, um, what happened, experiments were built, switched on, and particles were collided, and then a huge amount of stuff just came out, and experimentalists just went, and the theorists weren't expecting any of this. And so there was a lot of work on the theory side to explain what's come out of these experiments. The situation is a little bit reversed now, because theory is pushing for new physics and different sorts of measurements. And experimentalists are then looking. So the Higgs boson is a beautiful example. Peter Higgs' paper was published in 1964, I think, and it took until uh, 2012, whenever it was, for the Higgs boson to be discovered. So that's a beautiful example of a theory prediction which drove, really drove, an experimental program at the LHC. And so, as I said, this thing has been tested um, every way that you can imagine. So this is a very um, uh, busy slide, a uh, picture on the left-hand side, so don't worry about it. Um, it's a long list of things that have been measured in various ways um, at various experiments over the years. So it's a long list of things. It's a long list of very different things, including masses, branching fractions, um, ratios, decay ratios, widths of particles, all sorts of things uh, are sort of grouped together in some unhelpfully named uh, prop, um, things over here. But what you need to look at is what's happening um, on the, in the table, the part of the table that's labeled with 0, 1, 2, and 3. And that's measuring how far away the, um, um, the uh, experimental measurement is from the theory prediction, essentially. So the difference between theory and experiment uh, in some, you know, according to some prescription is given uh, by the size of those bars. And so the further you are from zero, which would be everything is beautifully aligned, that's a, a measure of how there's, you know, whether or not there's some disagreement. And some things are in less good agreement with uh, predictions or with the measurements um, than others. But there is nothing that reaches the, what they call the discovery level, which is five sigma. It would be a five um, on, this, um, on this plot here. So there is no quantity yet that really demonstrates a significant deviation from the standard model. There, uh, I'll say a little bit, um, you probably heard a little bit about G minus two, so the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, which was announced with great fanfare last year. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about that, which is the, one of the most promising deviations from the standard model um, that has happened in the last couple of years. But even there, there are lots of caveats. And I actually think it's probably not as exciting as usual. Um, this plot here, which is very colorful and looks really very nice, is a way to understand the, the standard model and whether or not your measurements agree with the standard model. So if, if you believe the previous picture and the way in which the standard model predicts that all of these interactions are going to happen, then you can draw a triangle. So this is the black triangle you see at the center there. Um, and the apex of that triangle, which is where the angle alpha is, the apex of that triangle should be at the intersection of all of these bands that you see um, roughly speaking, going through the apex of the triangle. These bands are the result of experimental measurements and combined with theoretical predictions for a whole range of different quantities. And the, the width of the bands tells you the uncertainty in the overall determination of that quantity. So what you want to do is to see do all of the bands, that's the first question, do all of the bands meet and go through this um, apex point? If they do, the standard model is doing a very good job at explaining and predicting all of the quantities that are fed into this. If they don't, then at least something is disagreeing with the standard model. And now you see that to really test this, what you have to do is to shrink the size of those bands, because right now it's like everything agrees. But if I shrink the size of those bands by a factor of 10, let's say, 
then suddenly there might be a discrepancy and one of them might not go through the apex of that triangle anymore. And that's a signal that there's some new physics in some quantity that I haven't taken into account, um, which is showing up in the experiment, but not taken into account in theory. But at the moment, it all looks sort of, as I said, embarrassingly successful. All right, but, so here are the caveats. There are, what I would say, I think I had said in the, in the abstract, sort of unanswerable questions from, with, unanswerable by the standard model. So the first is the obvious one. We know the gravity is not included in the standard model. So a, a natural question is how do you incorporate gravity into a unified description which has, um, as a prediction, all of the visible matter and the interactions that we see today. And that will not be answered by the standard model. It can't be answered by the standard model. Uh, another question that particle physicists like to torment themselves with is how do you explain the matter antimatter asymmetry that we see in the universe? So you look out, everything is matter, obviously. Uh, there is very little antimatter around. Um, and so that there is no a priori reason why there should be that uh, breaking of symmetry uh, between matter and antimatter. Obviously, it's useful for us here today that there is such a discrepancy between the amount of matter and antimatter in the universe, but it's not obvious that it had to be baked in, if you like, from the beginning. And that's something, again, the standard model can't really address. It can't tell us whether quarks and the leptons, like the electron and the neutrinos, are really, truly fundamental. It can't tell us why there seem to be three generations, so the, the quarks and the leptons seem to fit into families groups of three, and we don't know why. And then neutrinos are just weird. So we don't know, for example, why neutrinos are as light as they are. That doesn't, there's nothing in the standard model that tells us why they should be, and they really are so much lighter that fractions of an MeV compared to you know, hundreds of MeV or even GeV for other fundamental particles. We don't know really how they behave. We do know that neutrinos oscillate, and therefore they have mass, and even that is unexpected under the standard model. We really don't know very much about their own properties, whether they're, how they're related to their antiparticles. So we have neutrinos and antineutrinos. We don't understand how they're related to each other, and that's not explained by the standard model. And then there's a question of sterile neutrinos, whether or not these things exist. So a sterile neutrino is another neutrino which has not been discovered but would interact only with gravity through via gravity so it clearly sits outside the standard model since the standard model can't describe gravity but sterile neutrinos are attractive for a number of reasons they they somehow balance properties of the new active so-called active neutrinos that we know about um, but they also provide a candidate for dark matter so they're quite interesting from, um, from a theoretical perspective, from an experimental perspective. Um, there have been searches for these so-called sterile neutrinos. Uh, there are two experiments, mini boon and now micro boon, um, in the US, and micro boon reported recently no evidence, um, most recently, I think last year, no evidence for these sterile neutrinos. So they are at the moment ruled out, but they would be a natural candidate, for example, for dark matter and address some of, the, some of the questions that I posed above as well about neutrinos and their fundamental nature. <coughs> of course, there's also the question of dark matter. It's not made from the particles that form the standard model, so we don't really know have a way to understand it. We do know that there should be dark matter, and this is the sort of canonical picture that you see justifying, uh, at least in part, the existence or the presence of dark matter in our universe. So this, um, this is the rotating curve, rotation curve for galaxies, and it measures how matter uh, behaves as a function of the distance from the center of the galaxy. So the rotation curve of galaxies as you move away from the center of the galaxy. And what you see is the, the dotted line that sort of goes up and comes down again is the uh, expected um, result if there's only the visible matter in the universe, stars, and et cetera. Um, and what you see in yellow and then blue are the observed, is the observed rotation curve. Um, and that, of course, is very different from 
be expected, and that's what led. So this was predicted by uh, Roman Zwicky, uh, by Zwicky, sorry, and then uh, verified later by, for example, Vera Rubin and, and uh, collaborators in uh, observational uh, astronomy. This picture really, the only way to reconcile um, what you see with uh, some explanation is to have dark matter particles which are um, changing the rotation curve uh, so that it uh, behaves as we see and not as we expect according to the visible matter spectrum. Uh, okay, so there's a lot that we don't uh, really know and you could also ask, well, why are you just, why are you, I mean, there's, there are unanswerable questions, but also within the theory itself, it's somewhat unsatisfactory from just from a purely theoretical point of view. So it's clearly logically incomplete. I've said that already, there's no gravity involved. Um, theories which have, and I alluded to this earlier, so for example, string theories, where the standard model, the visible um, measured quantities that we see around us should emerge in some low energy limit, because otherwise string theory is not explaining uh, a unified picture of the four fundamental forces. If it can't, we produce what we see around us and measure an experiment. Um, so theories where that, where the standard model is reproduced in a low energy limit bring another symmetry uh, typically with them called supersymmetry. Supersymmetry has a lot of nice properties. So it, um, one way that people think about this is that it, it protects the Higgs boson. Um, and this is sometimes referred to as the hierarchy problem. So essentially what it means is that in a, in a quantum field theory description of matter, uh, a fundamental particle like the Higgs boson has a mass which uh, is sometimes called the bare mass, but, that, but the, the bare mass that it gains through the usual mechanism is modified by quantum corrections. So these are just interactions that it has with fermions and bosons in a, according to quantum mechanics. The problem for the Higgs boson is that uh, the modifications, these quantum corrections, can be very, very large. There's nothing to stop them being enormous. The Higgs boson itself is about 100 GeV, so 100 in some units, but the corrections can be from a theoretical perspective, as large as 10 to the 15 GeV. So what is it that protects the Higgs boson so that we measure it, we see it with a mass of 100 GeV, even though these quantum effects could be really very, very large? Supersymmetry steps in to sort of solve that problem for you by introducing, bringing with it, the symmetry brings a whole slew of new particles. So every fermion you have today in the world around you has a partner boson in supersymmetry. Every boson that you see in the world around you today has a partner fermion in supersymmetry. So these are all off at some higher energies, they're heavier things, but they balance very nicely uh, the whole particle spectrum. And they combine so that their quantum corrections cancel the quantum corrections that we have calculated with the stuff that we know about. Our fermions and bosons interacting are cancelled by Susie bosons and fermions interacting, and that protects the Higgs boson. It also gives us a candidate dark matter particle, so that's also very nice. The real problem, of course, at the moment is that nobody has found any supersymmetry. So the LHC is searching. If all of these particles are there, then the natural question is, well, where are they? Because we've now run an experiment at much higher energies looking for these particles and they haven't jumped out. So that is an open question um, for, well, for all of us to try to understand whether or not SUSY is really um, manifest at where we thought it should be. A, a closer to home sort of problem, and one which doesn't get, I think, enough attention, is a question about um, charge conjugation and parity. So the combination is called um, CP symmetry. So the, the picture is uh, a little bit like I've tried to draw here. So you have a relationship between a positively charged particle and a negatively charged particle. So between a particle and its antiparticle. You typically um, expect that, that would, there's a natural symmetry between those. And also parity is like a mirror symmetry. So something in, 
particle physics, we often refer to left-handed and right-handed particles, but parity is really just like a mirror symmetry, a reflection symmetry, a spatial reflection. And the combination of those two things uh, leads to this so-called CP symmetry. Uh, and if there really was a CP symmetry, then electrons and positrons would occur in sort of equal amounts. And they clearly don't. And there is a CP charge parity violating term in the QCD, so it's allowed by QCD, but it is vanishingly small from experimental constraints. There is no reason why it has to be that small. So we, it's empirically vanishingly small, which means that by measurement it's small. But we don't understand from a theoretical perspective why it's small. It doesn't have to be small. And that's something that keeps theorists awake. Right? Why, why is it small? It doesn't have to be small. It, okay, I mean, telling you that it is small isn't really an answer. So this is solved by the Pecci Quinn mechanism. So um, this, again, is somewhat underrated but rather beautiful way of addressing this uh, CP problem. And what they do is they introduce a new uh, symmetry, well, it's a new spontaneously broken symmetry. Anybody who knows me knows that I like spontaneously broken symmetries. And so this spontaneously broken symmetry brings with it a new particle called an axion, which are now very trendy these days. Uh, so axions then provide a candidate dark matter particle as well. So it has a lot going for it, uh, but of course nobody's found an axion yet, so we don't really know if they're there. So we don't really know if Pecci Quinn solves this CP problem yet for um, particle physics. But this is a, one of these questions that you don't really see discussed very much, but is somehow fundamentally worrying about a theory where we believe we really understand um, most of what's going on, but there are still some open questions. Okay, so if you take all of those, um, if you take all of those issues that one might have with a standard model, and ask, okay, right now I need to go and look for this new physics because obviously there is, there should be more out there. So there are a number of different ways that you can do this. So you can you can go bunk hunting, as they call it, um, and that's really just you keep hitting things off other things, colliding particles, and you look at what comes out. And then you wait to see, do you get a lot of energy uh, in you know, one particular collision? So that, and then that appears as a bump in your energy spectrum, and that's a new particle. So that's bump hunting. It's a very direct way of looking for new physics. You just collide, 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 and make, you know, reconstruct all of these events, and then you look to see, uh, is there something that you weren't expecting there? It has, by the way, been very successful as a strategy for a very long time, so you know, don't knock it. Um, there's a strategy which is quite similar called missing energy, which is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit more delicate, but it's basically the same idea. In collisions, you track everything. You track um, how charged particles behave in your collider, uh, how massive particles decay into other particles, which then have a trajectory, um, a little bit like bubble chambers of, of old and you track all of that in your detector, then you track it backwards to reconstruct what was happening at the collision point. And if there's missing energy or missing momentum anywhere, then you might describe that to a new particle that went through your detector without being detected and went off somewhere. It might be a neutrino, for example. It could be some dark matter particle that had some effect, small effect, but went off before your detector was able to pick it up, or maybe your detector can't pick it up. So that's the missing energy spectrum. And then, of course, you do uh, the more um, difficult work, in some sense, of looking for deviations from the standard model theory projections. If I calculate something within the theoretical framework of the standard model, and my friend at the experiment measures the same thing, and they don't agree, then that means that I haven't included all of the physics in my calculation. That's one interpretation, at least. The experiment is just the experiment, and it will have um, input from new physics. There can be uh, the effect of new physics in experimental measurements, not in my theory calculations, unless I put them in. So those discrepancies can be really important. And of course, it relies on you doing all of these things in a, a very delicate way between theory and experiment. 
the sort of the side effect of all of that, again, probably preaching to the choir here, um, is some new technologies that nobody really expected, including from CERN, for example, superconducting magnets. Everybody knows about the web, of course, but uh, superconducting magnets and proton therapies for cancer treatments are some of the really very exciting uh, industrial or other uh, impacts that have come from particle physics. So there's CERN, the LHC. So this is where you go bump hunting. Um, and obviously, it's, you know, it's huge and it's super impressive. So there's some statistics there that I won't uh, go through with you, but just you know it's there. It has uh, around the ring, it has detectors at four different points. And at those detectors, the collisions happen. And that's where they make these measurements about energy and charge and or track the, the uh, results of the, the uh, collisions. OK, so there's lots of really interesting stuff going on there. But from a theory perspective, well, at least from a QCD theory perspective, which is how I approach these things, it's certainly clear that supersymmetry has not jumped out in the way that it was really hoped that LHC would switch on and we would find new particles, and that hasn't happened. That means that we have to really think very hard about the precision tests of the standard model and where and how new physics impacts on the physics that we measure. So QCD is quantum chromodynamics. It tells you how the strong interaction works. Um, but it's also, rather beautifully, the only non-abelian strongly interaction quantum field theory. It is the only example of such a theory that has experimentally measurable consequences. So if you understand it and learn it with experiments that can test it, then you can take all of that information about how non-abelian field theories work and apply them in other scenarios. And that includes in uh, different fields of physics, for example, in condensed matter physics, but it also applies in, for example, in string theories, where in certain limits of string theories, there are uh, non-abelian theories, and really understanding how they work uh, is important. So it's a sort of sandbox for uh, these sorts of um, quantum field theories. OK, so understanding this is crucial. And here I mentioned G minus 2. And the reason I mentioned it is because you may have seen the, it was on, in the papers, there was a lot of coverage about it last year. It was a big experiment at Fermilab um, in the Midwest near Chicago. Uh, they had to, it's a long story, they had to move part of the experiment from Brookhaven, which is on Long Island, to Fermilab, which is in, near Chicago. To do that, they had to take this massive uh, ring experimental thing, they had to put it on a boat, they had to sail it down the east coast of America, up the Mississippi, then put it on some big truck, and drive it across the Midwest to the lab. So it was already a bit of a drama. And then they put it all together, and they ran the experiment. And the idea was to see, does the experiment agree with the theory predictions? And the answer, which we sort of knew from before, was no, it doesn't really agree very well. But the previous theory, the, sorry, the previous experimental measurements weren't as precise as was hoped from Fermilab. Fermilab did a fantastic job. They made a very precise measurement of this uh, muon, so the anomalous magnetic moment, the muon. Some quantity doesn't really matter, but they measured this quantity, and then they compared it to theory, and everybody got very excited because there was a 4.2 sigma deviation. Now, that's very close to five. And five is where you say you've discovered something. But in the same week, and this, I, I mean, I know the guy who wrote the paper, so this is sort of hilarious. In the same week, pretty much, that they made this announcement, a QCD calculation of the, for the theoretical um, prediction was announced. And it's in pretty good agreement with the experimental measurement. And it is one of the most precise theoretical calculations that has ever been done. And we don't understand why it doesn't agree with some of the other theoretical uh, calculations. And we don't understand yet where the real answer lies. So even there, there's still some, dis um, mis not misunderstanding, there's still some uncertainty, let's say, about what's really coming out of QCD and how you can compare theoretical calculations to experimental measures. 
So here's some other things that we don't understand. So this is for a theory that, as we'll see in a minute, I can write down a Lagrangian for you here today. We should be able to understand it, you would think. So what, do, what else don't we understand? And these are part of the known nodes, by the way, so you know. Uh, okay, so this is a phase diagram of, for QCE. So, you know, a phase diagram is a basic if you want to understand some phenomena. Um, what we understand about the phase diagram is all on one axis. I can go up and down that axis. Uh, if I stay low, so temperature is on the y-axis. If I stay at low temperatures, I'm in reasonable, um, reasonably solid ground. There I can make strong predictions about what's happening and have good confidence in it. The hotter I make my calculations, if you like, so the, the hotter the temperature becomes, the more difficult the calculation, theoretical calculations become. And of course, as you heat up uh, quarks and gluons, you start to go back in time, if you like, towards the conditions that existed in the early universe, fractions of a second after the Big Bang. So that's the direction that you're going in as you go up that axis. But in principle, at least, I know how to go up and down that axis, making calculations. As I go out, so this is chemical potential, essentially. So as I go along the x-axis, I know nothing, almost nothing. I have no theoretical tools that rigorously allow me to go in this direction. So this is a huge open question. There are models, and I can make some approximations, and I can try to understand some things. But from a first principles, from a theoretical calculation perspective, I can't go this way. So this is a huge open question. Nevertheless, with some approximations, you can try to map out a little bit what's going on and discover there's some critical point and uh, some phase lines, phase transitions, and try to understand a little bit about the picture. But it's mostly, I would say, uh, terra incognita. And here is something where, again, we would have expected that we know everything. Um, so this is uh, a, basically at zero temperature, so down at the sort of bottom of that axis. Uh, it's a spectrum of particles made from charm quarks and anti-charm quarks. So they're relatively heavy things. They're almost non-relativistic. I can make some nice calculations about their properties. So what you see here are the yellow states were established, measured at experiment, agreed with theoretical predictions. Life is good. Uh, the things in grey were predicted by experiments, waiting, well, sorry, predicted by theory, awaiting experimental discovery. And then the things in, I'm not even sure what that colour is, but anyway, the sort of reddish colour and the purple colour were found unexpectedly at experiments. And nobody really knows what they are. So we can measure some of their properties. I call the XYZs. We can measure some of their properties, but as to their actual structure, we don't really know. They're made up of charm and anti-charm quarks, but we don't know, for example, if they're tetraquarks, so four of these things in some combination. We don't know if they're loosely bound, sort of charm, anti-charm here, charm, anti-charm here, they sort of stick together in a loose way, so they look like they might be a big blob of four things, but they're really not, we don't know. We don't know, for example, in one case, we don't know uh, whether they have some weird excited glue going back and forth between the quarks, which is called a hybrid meson. So we don't know anything about them. Uh, they were discovered, but well, we know some things, but we don't know much. Um, they were discovered unexpectedly in 2003, which is already quite a while ago now, and there's been very little progress to really understand. Again, when I say understand, I don't mean using a model, I mean using the QCD Lagrangian that we can write down to understand these states um, from that Lagrangian. So there is a lot that QCD allows to happen. We can measure it in experiments, but understanding it from a theoretical perspective is actually really hard. So I talked about the QCD Lagrangian. It's here, it's the first line on that blackboard. So this is from Frank Wilczek, the talk he gave some time ago. So it looks, hopefully, I, I'm not sure there's certainly some people here from um, classical field theory and taking Samson's quantum field theory class. Uh, it looks pretty okay, right? It's got two bits. It's got two of these Gs describe the gauge field interactions in some sort of usual like field tensor type way. 
And then there's a bit that has fermions in it, so you can see the Q and the Q bars for their fermions, and you've got a derivative term and a mass term. So it looks, if you've seen Lagrangians for field theories, classical or quantum, it should look relatively straightforward. <coughs> It looks a lot like QED quantum electrodynamics, for which we know how to you know, really make very precise calculations. Yeah, but it turns out that it, it's a complete monster to try to actually calculate anything with. And the reason is that, see the piece where it says G is equal to something, and there's, got a, there's an A mu, A mu at the very end. That tells you that the gluons, so the gauge fields or the gluons in the theory are interacting with each other. And that doesn't happen. So photons don't interact with each other in QED. Gluons do interact with each other in QCD. And that makes everything very difficult. And it's that single piece that changes the whole uh, understanding of uh, QCD. So here's, um, so, so the first thing I have to say is that this is an animated uh, little movie in a Beamer slide presentation. So now this is why I was this morning at the Journal Club. I was just so excited. And Michael can tell you that my colleagues were very impressed <laughs> with my uh, managing to do this. This is, um, this is Beamer, and you know it's not friendly for um, movies and things like that. So, um, OK, anyway, that's enough. I'm unreasonably pleased with myself when I managed to <laughs> this could actually work. OK. So you can ask what a quantum field theory is anyway and why it's actually difficult to work with. So I don't want to go into this in much detail, but maybe just to say that instead of a quantum mechanical picture where you think about single particles, in a quantum field theory particle, you're trying, you're describing very many particles and their interactions all in one go. Um, and also the, the vacuum is not static. So even if you take away the particles, the fermions that you saw on the previous uh, page, then they're still in the in the, the in the vacuum without particles. Um, the field has enough energy to create and destroy uh, particles. And this is an animation of a simulation that basically does that. So this is the QCD vacuum, and you can see that you know, the, the different colors are as the energy grows and it pops, and then they they're created and annihilated instantaneously, and this is happening all the time. And into that, you then put um, quarks and particles that propagate through this vacuum. So when you make a calculation, you have to understand what's happening at this level, and then how do particles interact as they move through this, um, this very energetic vacuum. OK, so um, this is um, just a very, maybe a bit too technical, but QCD is, is Sometimes I would, you know, I do a lot of uh, these large numerical simulations. People are always talking about hero applications. So a hero application is something that, you know, just sort of is this crazy application that soaks up all the compute time and, and all basically your will to live just to, to sort of make the application or do make the calculations. And in quantum field theory language, I would say QCD is sort of a hero in that sense because it comes with a huge array of symmetries which must all be respected. So there are color symmetries related to the interaction itself, chiral symmetries, which are related to how massless particles interact, baryon number symmetries, axial charge conservation. We've got a whole lot of stuff going on <coughs> here. So all of this has to be respected and included in any calculation that you make. OK. And maybe importantly, it has nothing to do with uh, PJ Higgs. So you often hear people talking about the Higgs gives mass to everything, but it really doesn't. It gives mass to the fundamental particles, so the, to the quarks, but not to the, uh, for example, proton, which is made up of quarks. So the up quark and the down quark, which make up a proton, is two up quarks and a down quark. And up is about two, let's say, in some units, and a down quark is close to five in some units. Uh, so if you add up two of those, uh, you get something, and then two ups and a down, you get something that's maybe close to 10 in some units, but the mass of the proton is 938 in the same units. So only about a percent of the proton's mass is really coming from the constituent matter of particles. And the rest of the mass of the proton is coming from the interactions 
of those fundamental particles, the energy in the interaction between those fundamental particles. So the proton is some sort of emergent, it's a long range phenomenon that is a result of how the quarks and gluons interact, not from the mass of the quarks themselves. Um, which is what, so the Higgs mechanism gives the mass, gives the quarks their mass, but the proton gets its mass from QCD. And this is a sort of a, a silly picture of exactly what's happening. So you have quarks which are stuck together, bound together by gluons, and QCD describes how that happens for you. And if you understand it properly, you get a million dollars. Um, so the, the color force, so the way to think about this, so what this picture is telling you, this picture describes, on, on, not the three fellows, the picture here on the, the left hand side. <laughs> the picture describes how the interaction, so the energy between two quarks is you pull them apart. Okay. So you take, uh, it's a quark and an anti-quark really, so you take them and you try to pull them apart. So as you, essentially as you try to pull them apart, the strength of the interaction increases with the distance. So that's what the, the previous picture was attempting to show you, so that you can, so the energy as they move away from each other increases. And it's that energy that, again, with um, Einstein's equivalence between energy and mass, you can understand how that energy is lending mass to the proton, because it's the interaction between quarks in the proton that really results in the energy, in the mass of the observed quantity. So understanding this idea of what's called asymptotic freedom, so why is it asymptotic freedom? It means that when you put the quarks very close together, they don't have to worry too much about the interaction, and so they, they only interact weakly with each other. And as you try to pull them apart, they get very strongly interacting. So at short distances, they're essentially free, they don't care about each other, and at long distances, they're very tightly bound to each other. So the explanation for this is, was by these three gentlemen who had a Nobel Prize for their, um, for their trouble. Uh, Frank Wilczek uh, is on the right hand side, and it was his writing that you saw on the blackboard that I showed you the QCD The The bottom line is that uh, what this tells you is that at short distances, perturbation theory will work because the coupling strength is very small, and so I can do perturbative expansion, like a Taylor series expansion, and everything will work very well. As large distances, when the coupling, the strength of the interaction is very large, Perturbation theory completely fails, and I have no theoretical tools, or at least that was the picture in the 70s and 80s, at my disposal to address this uh, problem. So even though we have a Lagrangian, we have to work really hard to calculate. And this is just what I was saying. So if you go deep inside the proton at short distances, everything in weak coupling and perturbation theory works very well. If you push out to try to look at hadronic distances, then here, the interaction is very strong, and perturbation theory fails, and you need a new way of looking at the uh, physics. So that's where this so-called lattice approach comes in, and uh, I won't say much about that, except that it was uh, formulated first by Ken Wilson, and then the first numerical simulations were by uh, Mike Kreutz at Brookhaven in the early 80s. So it's been um, really a field, an active field, since about the early 80s, I would say. Um, this is quite busy for this later stage of the evening, so I won't say much here. You can just focus on the cartoon. What you do, <laughs> what you do is you, you have quarks and gluons, and essentially what we want to do is to, instead of thinking about a continuum space-time, we think about a discrete space-time. So we, we take the world and we put it into a four-dimensional grid. Uh, so I've got three space and one time dimension, of course. Uh, and then I say, okay, the fermions, the quarks, sit on the sides of this lattice, and they must sit there. And the gluons are the link, you can think about them as the links, so they, they tie the quarks together on this lattice. And so that's the basic picture. Um, and then it turns out that this actually, um, you can write down the QCD path integral in a very nice way, and you can solve it numerically. A lot of the ideas from statistical mechanics that you will be familiar with, or dealing with probabilistic systems in statistical mechanics, um, carry over because the integral that you end up writing down looks very much like an integral that you see in uh, statistical mechanics. So a lot of the ideas from there were borrowed by um, QCD people to make these calculations. And then maybe the one last thing I will say very quickly is to make any of this work 
you have to do a weak rotation that takes you from Minkowski space-time metric to a Euclidean space-time metric. And it is that step that, first of all, allows you to do any numerical simulations, but secondly, pushes you. Do you remember the phase diagram where you can't go out in chemical potential? That basically, this step, the weak rotation to Euclidean space, forces that uh, conundrum upon you because um, if you try to add in a chemical potential, the action that you see upstairs in the exponential there um, becomes complex and it's no longer a probability weight and all of the numerical stuff fails. So that's a very short um, reason why you can't actually do anything uh, along that x-axis in the phase diagram. But what you can do now is to start making exotic combinations of quarks and gluons in any combination that you want and trying in your numerical simulation to see what properties they have. So because you start in the numerical simulation from the Lagrangian, it's not a model. So you can actually really do QCD. Of course, you're limited by some numerical issues and that's another problem, but you can at least start from the sort of solid theoretical foundations. So you can make all sorts of things, mesons and baryons, so that would just be baryons are just protons and neutrons as well as other things. Mesons are like pions, for example. But you can make all sorts of combinations of quarks, as I've shown here, including these exotic things called hybrids and even glue balls, where you have no quarks at all, but just gluons that interact with each other, remember? So they interact with each other so that you can measure, in the end, a particle called a glue ball. Now, nobody's found a glue ball yet, but uh, in principle, QCD allows them, and we know from experience that if QCD allows something, you almost certainly find it. You just have to you know, work hard at it. So I thought I'd show you some results just to convince you that these things really uh, all work. They're very different, and I, I will be uh, done with this now, I think. Uh, sorry for running it slightly over time. This is to show you the sort of, um, well, it's, it, I'm slightly biased, but anyway, this is a, sort of a breadth of what you can do these days. So these are, on the right hand side, calculations of um, mass differences in the baryon spectrum. So for example, neutron proton, that's the, the, the really uh, important one, which is the neutron proton mass difference. That's a very tiny number, actually. Um, so being able to measure it very precisely is important. So the lattice, the theoretical calculations of the red dots the, with error bars which are too small in most cases to see. Uh, and the lines are the experimental measurement. And you see that the neutron-proton mass difference is now very well understood from a theoretical point of view and agrees with experiment. Uh, and the, the, uh, the red dots, which have um, the blue box above them describing what they are, uh, that just means that they were predicted first by the calculation, by the theoretical calculation, and then later verified by experiment, we see it's a very beautiful agreement. So this is the light baryons made up of up and down quarks. It's extremely beautifully mapped out from a theoretical perspective. So that's an example of precision work. And over there, that's an example of sort of a bit more out there stuff. So this is finite temperature, uh, looking to see what happens if you take some uh, particles and you put them into this uh, hot environment. So what you'd like to know is when do they melt? How do they um, do they melt? You know, uh, as soon as they cross the transition temperature. So as they go through a phase transition, do they melt immediately? Do the quarks start to um, move away from each other in the in the hot environment, or do these states, which are bound states of QCD, you know, where they're strongly interacting, do they stay strongly interacting? We really don't know how the so-called quark gluon plasma, so what the universe looked like in the early Big Bang, we really don't know how states interacted and traveled through that medium. And this is a measurement, so you changing the temperature as you go from left to right and top to bottom, increasing the temperature, and the height of, and the sharpness of those peaks is a measure of how tightly bound the states are. So you see at zero temperature, it's very high and very sharp peak, it's tightly bound, and as you heat up the system, this all starts to melt, and you can draw some conclusions about what happened to the state as you went to, in this case, up to twice the critical temperature in QCD. Um, 
So you can do a whole range of things. So from precision work to, it's not quite speculative, but, but certainly more, um, uh, um, less precise in, this, in terms of controlling uncertainties, but more exploratory in terms of trying to understand uh, finite temperature physics. So there's a whole lot of things that you can do. And um, again, maybe just to say that you often, maybe I suppose, if you hang out with the, the lattice people, you'll hear us talking a lot about computational cost. And the reason for that is that the cost of your simulation essentially goes uh, like this uh, expression on the right hand side. So you'd expect that the more of those uh, gauge configurations, like I showed in the movie, the more of those you want, the more expensive it gets, because that costs you something. It also costs you, L is the size of the lattice, the box that you have in space and time. So obviously, if you make that bigger, you've got to pay a price. But unfortunately, it scales like L to the 5, where L is the size of the box. Um, a is the lattice spacing, so it's the, the fineness of the grid in the box. So what do you want, ideally? You want a big box with a fine grid. Okay? But now look at what happens. The big box goes like L to the 5, and the fine grid goes like the inverse lattice spacing, so the inverse <coughs> distance to a power 7, so everything is against you. And then the high on mass, which you want to be small, goes like uh, a sixth power. So you want m pi to be very small, and um, the other numbers, as I said already. So all of these combine in some horrible way to make the whole thing ferociously expensive. And that's only the first part. And then the second part involves uh, inverting a matrix that's easily <coughs> a million squared matrix. Uh, I mean, multiple times, and by multiple, I mean uh, hundreds of thousands of times. So, you know, <coughs> it takes a big computer. So here's the big computer um, that we run on. Actually, this poor computer has been since decommissioned, and now we're waiting for the next big one to come along. So it's, as well as the theoretical challenge of understanding QCD, you also have a numerical challenge, which is how do you translate what you want to do in physics into a computationally tractable algorithm that you can actually run in a finite amount of time. So there's a lot going on, sort of, as I said, under the hood of that, with that. Okay, so I'm way out of time, so I'm going to stop now. Just to say that there are loads of questions, of course. There are still, despite all of the work in the field, many more questions, I would say, than answers. If anything, the questions are multiplying. Um, so this is a very fast-moving field at the moment. We're still trying to explore the meaning, the, the nature and the structure of matter at its most fundamental levels. And we don't understand a lot of the questions. Even posing the questions and understanding how to answer them is difficult in places. But although there has been huge progress, which hopefully you can have, you'll have seen from the standard model, for example, and, and other results that I showed you, there are many new ideas which are needed to explain the many questions that are left unanswered. And in this theory and experiment really complement each other. They work together to answer these questions and inform each other in a very useful way, I would say. Um, if you think that we should be part of this, and I really think we should, then I firmly believe that we should be a member of CERN. Ireland is not yet a member of CERN. Um, there's a link at the bottom here, so this is a, a live link to the users page which we have now created, which will help you to see what's happening in Ireland uh, that's connected to certain activities. So um, tell your parents, tell your politicians, you should join CERN. And I think with that, I'll finish.